Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with music I just didn't get until I heard version mm, by... <laughs> yeah, I just didn't get it till I heard that special version in, under those special circumstances. Well, the work I just didn't get was Respighi's The Pines of Rome. I know. You're going to be saying to yourself... He's a percussionist. He loves big, splashy orchestral pieces. He plays the tam-tam. And he didn't get the Pines of Rome? I didn't get the Pines of Rome. But here's why I didn't get the Pines of Rome, or how it happened that I didn't get the Pines of Rome. I mean, I remember these things so vividly, you know, these childhood experiences. I was very, very young. I was about 13, 12 or 13. No, it was, I was about 13. And and my my grandmother was was quite ill. My mother's mother. She had a bad heart. She was only fifty eight when she passed away, and she had to move into a new house because she couldn't handle stairs. She lived in a in Wilmington, Delaware, in a in a multi story house, and she couldn't do stairs. So she had to buy a house that was all on one level, and we moved her. We moved her in there, and she had a little a little stereo system, and she had her bunch of records, and we were packing and unpacking, and I was playing through her records as I did everybody's records and found some amazing things in my grandparents' record collections, I have to tell you. Um, but that's another, that's, that's a story for another day. So one of the things that she had was this thing. It was an album. It was the Pines of Rome and the Fountains of Rome with Fritz Reiner and the Chicago Symphony. I had no idea. I was 13. I had no idea what the Pines of Rome was. I didn't know what a Respighi was. I thought it was like, you know, an Italian, it's like lasagna. You know, some people have the lasagna, some people have the Respighi. I figured it was like something you ordered at a restaurant. And the cover was, you know, pictures of Rome, it did not strike me as a piece of classical music at all. And in the age of 13, I was self-conscious about liking classical music. And I wanted to hear more classical music because I liked classical music. And what's more, my grandmother's record collection is where I discovered Haydn Symphony No. 88, one of my all-time favorite pieces of classical music, because she had that too. And it was also with Fritz Reiner in the Chicago Symphony. So I said to myself, aha! It must be like the Haydn Symphony. So I put on the Pines of Rome, and of course, you know what that sounds like. It's like, boom, foosh, you know, the, the, the fireworks going off, and the harps going, and the glockenspiel glocking, and then, and, 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 you know, you know, it's going off like crazy. And I said to myself, what the hell is that? So I said, first of all, why does anyone want to write something about pines in Rome? What, 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 what is that? What are pines in Rome? So I said to my grandmother, um, it was very ill and she was really bedridden. And I said to her, you know, what the hell is this? <laughs> what is this? She said, well, I went to Rome. And when we were in Rome, I, you know, I, I, I saw this was about Rome. So somehow she acquired this, this album that was about Rome that reminded her of her trip to Rome which is very nice. And it did nothing for me whatsoever. I mean, it, it just sounded to me like, like TV or movie music that you pay no attention to, like a soundtrack to something that, that, you know, didn't exist. So I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get my brain around it. And the fountains of Rome just bored me to death because it was like, I bored me to death. Couldn't, couldn't make heads or heads nor tails out of it. I really couldn't. And and so I just put it away, and then that was that. That was the end. I figured, nah, never again. That thing was, I just forgot all about it. I really did. I forgot about it entirely um, until a few years later, not a few years, like maybe a year later, or two years later, I don't know. Uh, I acquired another one from Reader's Digest of all places. Remember Reader's Digest had all these recordings um, that they were offering very inexpensively. And I think I got this LP. It was at Goodwill in Milford, Connecticut, where I lived. I mean, Goodwill was such a resource for records. I can't even tell you. Um, and it featured Pines of Rome with Rudolf Kempe and the Royal Philharmonic coupled to Strauss's Don Juan. Now, I got it for the Strauss Don Juan because I was curious about it. I'd read something about it somewhere. 
and I wanted to hear the Strauss, and this thing was on the other side. So I got that album, and the Strauss was brilliant. It was wonderful, and I enjoyed it very much. And then I turned the record over, and there was the Pines of Rome. And I put it on again, and I went, whoa, I remember that. Grandma had that. Um, and oh, it just blew me away. Oh my goodness, it knocked my socks off. But I think the reason it knocked my socks off is because I heard it at, at the same time that I heard Strauss's Don Juan, because it's a piece very much in that tradition. There was the same brilliance, the same kind of energetic, you know, pull out all the stops, orchestral fireworks stuff going off. And I was, I was ready for it. It didn't sound like Haydn's 88th Symphony. I didn't expect those pieces to sound like Haydn's 88th Symphony. And so then, and then I went back to Delaware at one point to visit my grandmother and that album was still sitting there. And I said to her, you know, I really, do you mind if I listen to that thing again? Because I didn't want to bother her. And she said, ah, you can have it. <laughs> she said, it's okay, just take it. So then I got the Reiner version of the Pines and Fountains and I loved them. I love them. I mean, you, you might say to yourself, how could he not have loved the Fritz Reiner Pines of Rome, which is like the reference recording for the Pines of Rome. So is the Kemper. Those are like the two, or they were the two in the you know 60s and 70s and in and, and 80s and in that period. And I, I, what can I say? I mean, it just struck me as something that was so stylistically foreign to what my expectations were of a piece of classical music. I mean, I didn't know from things like symphonic poems, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't something that was in my wheelhouse at all. I was just figuring out what symphonies were and, and concertos and then the 1812 overture, the overture I got, you know, but, but this thing, this, this multi-movement behemoth about trees in Rome where I'd never been and had no intention of going at that point in my career, I mean, in my, my youth, it, it passed me over and it took a, a different listening scenario, a different environment or set of circumstances before I could finally, I could finally conceptualize what the thing was about, what it was doing. Of course, I read the notes and all that stuff, but none of that mattered. And it really is, uh, you know, a piece of music that does sound tremendously <laughs> like like a, a film score in search of a film, doesn't it? But then again, all of those late romantic tone poems kind of do that. They take a big orchestra and use it in the most splashy and brilliant possible way. And, you know, profundity is not exactly the point. Um, it's about brilliance. It's about the physicality of the music, the visual aspect of the music. And And speaking personally, I have never been a visual person. When it comes to like music and imagery, I mean, in operas being staged and watching, and I, 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 I like to see or I, I like to use my ears, and I like to use my ears not to see with my ears, but I like to use my ears in it in the service of abstract musical forms. I mean, I, I guess some people are just kind of like that. It took me a lot longer to try and figure out the programmatic aspect, and it's ironic because you know as I said many times on this channel and told this story, my, my first sort of classical revelation was Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, where I looked at a picture and listened to the music and I heard the picture. I got it. But for some reason with Respighi, I didn't get it. And I think the other reason I probably didn't get it is because the style was contemporary. It was modern. It was that of of Hollywood, of, of film music, of, 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 you know, sort of the usual entertainment that I saw day in, day out. And so I didn't regard it as anything special, which of course it is. It's very special. It's special of its kind. And getting to know what kind that was, was a big lesson for me because one of the things we take away from the world of classical music is that classical music is, it is a kind, but a very limited kind. But in the broader sense, it's it's the best of all of the different kinds from, you know, the 12th century, from notated music to something written last week. And so you have to get used to many different kinds, many different styles. There is no one thing that is our classical music tradition. And of course, I adore Respighi now, and I adore the Reiner performances of the Pines and Fountains of Rome, which made no impression on me whatsoever when I first heard them. And that's, uh, that's how it happened. 
I, I, I think back on it and I just have to laugh because because it was so it was so strange. I remember just how strange that music sounded. And it has nothing to do. I, I saw in the comments, one of you said, well, you know, we were talking about the previous video about the St. Matthew Passion. Well, it's just a very approachable work. It has nothing to do with approachability, nothing whatsoever. It has to do with how you respond to it when you hear it. I didn't have any trouble with approaching it. If anything, it was just the opposite. It was too approachable. It sounded it sounded too glitzy and, and, and trashy and superficial and uninteresting. I wanted, wanted something with maybe more meat on its bones, at least as I thought about it when I was 13. Um, now, of course, with the wisdom of incipient old age, I know better. And, and Respighi's Pines of Rome is one of the glories of the orchestral repertoire. But it wasn't when I was 13. I had to wait till I was 14. Then I figured it out. But it was a funny, funny experience because I remember very sheepishly asking my grandmother if I could have her Respighi album after that because I knew what I'd missed the first time around. So did you have similar experience with works like anything? We don't have to talk about Respighi, folks. It could be anything. I mean, the whole point is to share your experience of any work whatsoever that 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 gave you problems the first 50 or 60 times you listened to it and only struck you when you heard one special version. And I got to say, I was lucky. I was lucky because the one I disliked was Reiner and the one I loved was Kempa. And I couldn't have had two better recordings, really, to, 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 to cut my teeth on. But uh, it took a while. It took a while and it took the right circumstances. So thank you so much for joining me, friends. Keep on listening. Take care.